My name is Rema Scheffold. I'm born in 1938 in the city of Basel in Switzerland. My parents were of German origin. My father was professor of archaeology at the University of Basel and he was the founder of the Archaeological Museum, which still exists there. And my parents had moved to Switzerland because my father, who was assistant at the German Archaeological Institute in Athens at the time, got into con conflict with his employers because of my mother, who was of half Jewish origin. So they left Athens and didn't back, go back to Germany, but went directly to Switzerland. I owe my father early interest in art. And to my mother's side, um, I own also a very different kind of heritage. My mother was the daughter of the anthropologist Karl von Steinen, who was famous, uh, living in Berlin, famous at the time because he, of his expedi expedition to one of the tributaries of the Amazon River in uh, Brazil, where he was the first to lay contact with a group of Indian tribes living there at the headquarters. And he wrote a book ab about um, them which made him quite famous because he had a very um, respectful and sympathetic attitude. He described them in the tradition of Adolf Bastian, who had been his mentor and who uh, taught him to see the cultural things as he saw there as um, providing ideas of how human life in prehistoric times would have looked like. At the end of the century, Karl von Stein went to the Marquesas in Eastern Polynesia with the task to make a comprehensive and well-documented collection of Marquesan art and writing up their traditions for the Berlin Ethnological Museum. He stayed there for half a year and included in the three volumes of his results, a documentation of, I, I'll, show, I'll show you one of the covers of these enormous volumes. And this is the one on tattooing. Tattooing had been forbidden by the French as a, a, uh, in their colonial attitude as a sign of um, primitiveness and uh, he was still able to draw all the patterns on all the people and get drawings of all the masters of the doing for uh, documenting the different motives. His collection of uh, Marquesan art is now to be transferred to the new Humboldt Forum in Berlin. And in connection with this, something happened which is quite noteworthy in co a connection with the recent discussion about restitution of uh, old collections to the original owners. The family got a letter from some Marquesans uh, who had heard about the Humboldt Forum and asked if it could be arranged for them at this occasion to honor the memory of my grandfather by dancing for him on his grave. Um, Marquesan culture is experiencing a revival at this moment and the people felt grateful through documenting their culture. He had uh, preserved um, something which otherwise would have been lost. He had written, as they express it in their email, their Bible. My mother used to tell me a lot of stories about, my fa about her father. One of these is quite typical and has made a great expression on me when I was a child. Van Steinen has taken one of his sons to a restaurant where they, he ordered a dessert. 
Then he went with his son to the second restaurant and they ate the main course. And then he went to the third restaurant where they ate soup. And there he got, uh, his son got a lesson. You see, our ways of eating is pure convention. Everything we do could also be quite different. And it's up to you to choose what you think is best. My own de decision of I wanted to study was quite different from my upbringing, however. Since my childhood I had regularly gone to the zoo and had read a lot about animal behavior, so I began my study in zoology. But I had kept anthropology as a minor. During a period of practical training at the Ethnological Museum in Munich, I had to assist the unpacking of its South Sea collections that had been stored away during the Second World War. I had not been happy with my zoological choice for quite a time because of the pertinent scientific emphasis on chemistry. I very well remember how at a certain moment we unwrapped the staff god from the Cook Islands and I was suddenly struck so much by the aesthetic beauty of that object that I decided to shift my study to anthropology. So I went back to Basel to take up the study of anthropology. Basel had an old tradition in this field, mostly based on the wealthy local bourgeois elite, where younger sons were looking for own fields of activity. The cousin Saracens were well known by their extensive travels in Southeast Asia, notably in Sulawesi, and Felix Speiser, another remote cousin, had introduced anthropology as a study at, at the university where he taught about his experiences in various cultures in Melanesia. A romantic outsider was Paul Wirtz, who lived secluded in the countryside after long periods of staying with hardly contacted groups in Dutch New Guinea. Anthropology in the German-speaking world was at the time dominated by the diffusionist cultural historical school. My uh, teacher, Alfred Bühler, was a specialist in New Guinea and in the study of material culture and also of uh, textile uh, traditions. He had composed huge co collections of artifacts of uh, the New Guinea region, which at the time of my study were uh, arriving in the Museum for Volkkunde, which is now called uh, Museum de Kulturum. I became his assistant and got the task of cataloging the new arrivals. Soon came the time of selecting a theme for my doctoral dissertation. Bühler and his colleague Karl August Schmitz suggested a style analysis of the human figures of the Sepik district in northeast New Guinea, which were to be found on the numerous collected suspension hooks from the Sepik. The forms of the faces of these figures were extremely varied and my task was to discover among these forms an eventual local development and in this way identify the initial designs. These then could be compared and connected with similar forms in neighboring regions in order to get insights in the historical distribution. The statistical method I used in my research appears to me quite questionable and outdated now, but in the end I was able to reconstruct an internal formal evolution in the style of the figures and to specify certain basic face designs which indeed could be traced back in a vast region of Melanesia. As everything uh, was published in German, this is the book of the, thesis, of the PhD thesis. I am afraid that with the exception of the late Anthony Forge in Canberra, not many people have noticed, noticed this book. And I secretly hope that some of it will make some closer attention in the time to come. And also I attempted to explain the direction of the internal formal evolution by relating it to general trends in the local culture of its makers something I see now as a prelude to my later work. I always wanted to understand 
a particular cultural development in relationship with environment in the broadest sense, searching for the incentives that might have triggered it and what kind of influences determined its course. Now what you see here are actually um, in the upper corner here. No, here. In this corner you see three faces from the Sepik district and um, they have all in common certain traits which you can easily discern. And ex um, what I found interesting are the prolongations from the A's, eyes going up or down. And now what follows are photographs all around Melanesia from uh, New Guinea until New Caledonia, where you find these uh, forms back. You find again these prolongations, you find the round eyes, you find the re relief bands as um, markers of the different parts of the face. I just wanted to show you that. I go on with um, my, uh, the period after my promotion. The first step afterwards was to find a localization to do field work. I do, did not want to go to New Guinea because at the time uh, the Sepik district was inundated by anthropologists mm -hmm. and the joke went that the uh, average Sepik family consisted of a father, a mother, three children and an anthropologist. So I didn't want to be one of these anthropologists, but I had found in the art of the Sepik quite a few traces of influences from the West, from Indonesia, and had begun to read about this island group and was very quick, very fascinated by the beauty of the people and by the magnificence of the uh, land they lived in and the enormous cultural diversity. This was the period of the 60s and we were all under the influence of flower power and looking for alternative ways of life. Um, I thought that perhaps among such kind of people I would find answer to our, answers to our questions. So I must, uh, to be honest, um, confess that it was for a large part romanticism and not theoretical interest that brought me to uh, uh, search for a place for research in Indonesia. I um, was looking for a society that was not to a big degree influenced by modern Western influences. So I went to the Netherlands with its long, um, uh, with its many archives as a former colonial power of Indonesia. And after long exploration, Siburut in the Mentawe archipelago west of Sumatra emerged as a promising possibility. A German missionary had been installed there for the first time and the mission reported to me that he had told them of people in the interior who wanted to defend their territory with bows and arrows. So, so that's a very promising situation for a young anthropologist. And I prepared by trip, learning Indonesian, reading everything no available on Mentawe, and studying the material culture that he collected there in various European museums. Access to Mentawe proved to be difficult. There was no regular boat connection to the islands. But the main problem, problems were political. After its declaration of independence in 1945, Indonesia stood under the sign of nation building. President Sukarno had decreed that every society had to follow national priorities and that large, uh, local peculiarities such as animism, animistic beliefs, should be given up and officially forbidden. Mentawe proved to be a place where such traditions still were adhered to and people were under a strong and threatening regime to adapt to the mainstream 
of modern Indonesian society. Though at that period, they were practically illegal. However, thanks to the Indonesian Research Institute, LIPI, and several influential friends, I got my permit and transferred my life to the Sakulde, a traditional group who lived somewhat secluded in the interior of the island seaboard and in a period before the emergence, emergence of mobile phones, this step signified a period of nearly two, total isolation for almost two years. I had heard about the Sukunde after my arrival. They were one of the groups that were opposing the modernizing campaigns of the government and wanted to continue their traditional way of life. It was not easy to reach them. We had to travel around the island. It was an island as big as Bali, quite a big island. It's called Sibirut. And um, there we came to the mouth of a river whose upstream region was the place where the Sakude lived. From there, I was traveling there with the German missionary I had met at his station at the other side of the island. We went around the island together. And then we found at the mouth of the river a man who was married to a girl of the Sakude group and was prepared to go before us and announce our, our arrival because we had, of course, no idea how we would be received. Um, so we went there um, and arrived at the community house, a long house built on piles called Uma, and um, were received by a group which was very anxious because they had received their brother-in-law, but they did, still didn't know whether uh, it was true what he was going to tell them. And they, for the younger people, it was the first Westerner they saw. So they were very curious about my arrival, about all I had brought with me, my shirt, my camera, my, uh, my watch, my photo, my photo camera, and uh, wanted to know what it meant, what was the use of all these things. And then I asked where I had come. And I told them, you were very curious about my equipment and about my person. And we too, we are very curious about you. We have heard that you exist, but nobody knows you. So at my home, we, they have uh, sent me to learn to know you and to tell about you when I go back again. So if you, can, if you agree, I would like to stay with you for a time and write up what you do and then tell my friends at home about your life. And they said, it's very clever that you came to us because we are the group who still lives exactly like Mentawe has always been and you can tell your people about our real culture. I, my entry was really made easy by the very friendly attitude of the people who, um, who uh, after beginning of big suspicion, began to trust me. I have described this in the book um, Ein bedrohtes Paradies, which is, yeah, which is lying just below, yeah, this one, and uh, which has also been translated into Indonesian. This is German edition, there's also a Dutch edition, and this is the Indonesian one. And I have uh, described in that book my time with Sakude from the beginning until the departure after two years. They, Sakude had built a, lit, built a little house for me where I could stay with my equipment, with my books, but I ate with them and shared their daily life. The people were very much afraid of the orders of the Sukarno government, of which I had heard and which menaced their life, and they hoped that I, through my presence, would be able to protect them in a way. And also the idea fascinated them that through my writing it up, their culture would be known for future generations to come. Much of my time there was uh, spent with documenting and um, their day-to-day -day activities. I uh, attempted, attempted to cover all aspects of Mentawe culture in a holistic way. 
and um, so at once several traits which are obvious, for instance, the egalitarian uh, uh, organization, they had no chiefs, everybody was actually <coughs> at the same rank, and um, only between men and women there was a difference in work specialization. Men had their specific tasks, working on sago, hunting in the forest, women kept taro um, roots and bananas and were fishing in the streams. Um, metal work was unknown. They got from Malay traders at the coast in exchange metal tools since generations. So they were having machetes and axes, which were very important in their daily life. When these decisions had to be taken, everybody was free to offer opinions, men, women, even children, and the explicit goal, aim, was to reach a consensus. If no consensus was reached, the only possibility, nobody could decide something against the will of a part of the group, um, then happened something which they were uh, fearing very much, and that was the splitting up of the group, that they had, the opposition had to move away and move their own group in the forest. And similar uh, with this ideal of reaching a consensus, a harmony within the group, was their attitude towards the outer world. They were far away from the aggressive behavior which some anthropologists have said to be a normal attribute of tribal societies. The explicit ideal was coexistence and um, upkeeping peace by having um, pacts with neighboring groups, for instance, through marriage. And of course, there were, despite that, constant quarrels, but the ideal was the opposite. And the same ideal of um, harmonious coexistence was, was also explicit in their relationship to the natural world. Um, Lumus taboo restrictions had to be observed when they worked in the vicinity. All things in the environment were considered to have a soul and wanted consideration of people who worked there. Taboos were a sign of these considerations. You refrained from certain things, which otherwise would uh, perhaps be um, rivaling what your uh, actual plans were. And the objects, ob <coughs> the obje objects expected from you these considerations, otherwise they would get angry and would make you ill. I <laughs> experienced this at my first hunting uh, exhibition uh, uh, trip with the Saku day when I was sleeping in a little field hut and in the morning I wanted to undo the knot of the rope of my mosquito net which I couldn't undo and was very um, impatient and just ripped it off. There came no comment, they were looking at it, didn't say anything, but during the trip itself one of the group people fell down from a steep, um, steep um, hill and hurted himself. And in the evening they were discussing why did this happen. And then an old man said to me, you see, um, our life doesn't want angry words. And you molested, you offended the, t the rope. And the rope said, okay, then uh, I give you something back, and so our camera comrade was falling down. So I had my first lesson. And an overarching principle in all these attitudes was the consideration with one's own soul. People uh, saw the souls as a kind of equivalent to everything, to every, everybody's life, and the souls were free to wander around, and um, they told what they experienced in dreams. And this was in itself not a problem, but if you were not behaving well, the soul got the, um, its um, well, it, it got its pleasure in life 
would detach itself from the body, would definitely move in with the ancestors, and this would mean that people, people would die. So this idea of living in harmony with one's own soul was a wonderful guiding principle in Metabe life. And um, it was quite rec recognizable, perhaps, for my own ways of thinking. For the idea, for the Kulde, the idea was of influence to everything they did. Their souls, a power, a power, haste, and moile, moile, slowly, slowly, was one thing they constantly said against each other. Rough behavior had also a negative effect, as the experience with the, cloud, with the mosquito net had shown, and uh, it would even physically endanger the vulnerable life of small children. They, if they would be treated very roughly, the risk was that they get sick and die. And the Sakuti self played with this sometimes towards me. They would say, uh, my soul urgently needs a little bit of tobacco. Tobacco was something I brought with me. It was an exchange uh, thing which I could give them and which they really wanted. And um, in order to make this clear, a person would say, my soul needs that. And um, something else is that life has to be beautiful. The painted birds, which they made, wooden birds, which they carved in, uh, for the rituals, were explicitly meant to attract the souls. They were called Toys for the Souls. That's the title of the book, which is uh, also lying there. And um, they were uh, something which the souls could be placated with when they were not content with the life of the individuals and which uh, attracted them to stay with the living. The Sakuti also helped me to collect equipment of theirs and art of them, which now is for the biggest part is accessible in the ethnological museums, especially in Leiden. Um, and the more I um, lived with them, the more I became interested in their own outlook on their way of life and the problems that everyday reality posed them. The rel religious ideas and the way this appeared in myths gave explicit views on the relevant basic views. But the longer I stayed with them, the more I became intrigued by the extensive rituals. They all had a magical component that was instrumental in the aim to reach a certain goal by re religious means. But why then all the complexity of the ritual processes with all its repetitions and alternations? That's for the next part.